Hello, I'm George Liston CA and welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Despite the recent diplomatic estrangement between France and America, or perhaps because of it, it's important to emphasize just how close ties between these two nations have been historically. Each country produced a seminal revolution, born of Enlightenment ideas, and America's revolutionary campaign was singularly aided by France. But it is in the commerce of ideas that this association has enjoyed its richest moments. And as we wrestle with vexing issues of social welfare, we might inform our debate with a close look at the performance of France's health care system, just as they might learn from ours. My guest is Paul Dutton, an historian of European social welfare, who is a current fellow of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Paul, welcome to Dialogue. Nice to be here, George. That's great to have you here, and I think we have a timely subject uh, yes, that everyone should is. be interested mm -hmm. in. Paul, I mentioned the uh, revolutionary roots of both of our societies, and I guess I'd like to start with that as an historical question to you, an historian, as we begin our discussion. Um, does that play into this, this uh, uh, revolutionary history, into the evolution of healthcare thinking in this country, and particularly in France, is it, or is that a... Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I really enjoyed uh, you, you know, your setup piece, or your setup comments were Thank very you. good there. I, I, because if you look at these 18th century revolutions, mm -hmm. um, they both stood for uh, popular sovereignty and right. individual liberties, individual rights, and that set up what I call uh, republican tensions hmm. in the books uh, in, the, in, the, in both countries, in which um, that have translated to their health care systems. Uh, yeah, very and, interesting. Yes, and so you, you end up with both countries really pursuing um, I, what, what the French set up in 1927. In fact, they called their, their Charte Medicale, which mm -hmm. is their sort of their medical charter of where they, uh, the patients are guaranteed um, you know, pa patient uh, choice of physician, um, doctors are guaranteed, um, the free practice of medicine, mm -hmm. etc. So, and, and in both countries, you have these values, mm -hmm. these value systems uh, towards healthcare that are surprisingly similar. Well, that's, that, that is fascinating, Paul. I mean, we're off to a great start because I, I get the sense that individual liberty of choice and collective equality mm -hmm. of access or condition are important to both of us. Is mm -hmm. is it there then um, appropriate to think that perhaps at one historical point or for a long time even that? We converged more than differed in terms of how we went about things. That's true. I mean, I, I in the study I'm, I'm doing right now, I have this dialogue, in fact, between these two physicians, mm -hmm. uh, an American physician and a French physician on the on the Western Front in 1917, and it's sort of a fictionalized dialogue. But it's really interesting because I can lay out rather, uh, I think, persuasively, that uh, those me the medical systems, the healthcare systems of the two countries were were about as similar as any two countries you could name in 1917. Let me make an instant actor out of you. Can sure. you can you re reproduce any of that? I mean, I mean, even a rough approximation of what these well, these two and these are these are based these are fictionalized doctors, American, an American and a Frenchman. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're clearly based on your conception of what men of that era were thinking about in these terms. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, I I think that the the French doctor uh, let's say we cut into their conversation, mm -hmm. and the French physician they would be sort of reminiscing about life back home, as so many of the soldiers right. on the Western Front did, and I think they would be talking about such things. The French doctor would be complaining about how these mutual aid societies, which are very similar to the fraternal orders, the fraternal lodges back in the United States, mm -hmm. wanted to hire a French physician, pay him uh, you know, miserly compensation to, to treat the whole membership. The American w physician would be sort of agreeing with that. Mm -hmm. um, then on the other hand, they would also complain and commiserate that, that the uh, company, do they, the companies, these large industrialists, just wanted to hire them on as company doctors right. and to treat their their uh, their employees. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that they would both reserve their both both uh, most vehement mm -hmm. um, you know exhortations for the governments actually of both uh, countries. I see. Um, they both of them feared government intervention into health care, and they would both point interestingly uh, across the barbed wire to the Germans uh -huh. and they would say that's what we don't want. We don't want a German style health care system and if there had been a Britain standing nearby that is an ally well then they would have a certain estrangement with that physician as well, a British physician because British physicians in 1911, 1912 had embraced 
uh, a state-directed uh, uh, sort of emergent national mm -hmm. health care uh, insurance system. So they, they do have these uh, real similarities in, in the teens. That's fascinating. I mean, uh, a lot of questions on this. But first of all, uh, you refer to this as a study, but this is going to be a book? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and is it written for a layperson? Will it be written for a layperson? I am writing it to reach as broad an op uh, audience as possible. Yeah, because yeah. I'm already intrigued. I mean, to, to get this kind of perception with that kind of treatment, uh, the, the, the dialogue that you've just uh, conveyed to us, and also this perception that comes through it, that in that particular episode, if I got it right, and perhaps for some time thereafter, we had a great deal of similarity with the French approach, mm -hmm. and perhaps um, not so much, or even some antagonism with the German or even the British. That, mm -hmm. Is that correct? To me? Absolutely. I mean, it, that, I'm just, uh, what I'm working with, of course, mm -hmm. primary sources, I'm working with medical journals of the period, and, right. and both of them, uh, of course, uh, were very critical of the German and uh, British models, mm -hmm. the directions that those countries were taking. Mm -hmm. um, and they played a large role in yeah. the uh, healthcare debates of the period. Because I think if you went out on the street, and if I were on the street myself answering my own question, uh, nine out of ten Ameri or some proportion would, be, would almost perhaps quickly respond that we had more in, in, in sync with the British than with the French, but that's not the case. No. In fact, uh, that's one of the points of the book, uh, yeah. is that I argue, and I think I show rather convincingly, that, that uh, the British system is, uh, is more different from ours than is the French. Mm -hmm. um, and, and mainly it has to do with insurance. I mean, we have an insurance system, right. um, and as do the French. Uh, they have a much more public insurance system. We rely more heavily on private, and I'm sure we can talk about this more. We're going to talk about that right yeah. now, because we're going to get uh, deeper in, in some aspects of the history and some aspects of the current problems and questions. But maybe it's a good time right now to explain this French system as it exists today, because mm -hmm. as we both know, it, 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 we'll go into the evolution of it, but as it stands now, uh, Paul, I'm sure you've heard this said, and maybe we probably should attack it at this moment, and the question is this, have the French evolved to socialize? Is it socialized medicine that they're practicing there? That's very often the rap you hear in this country. Right, right, and it has a rap, and I'm glad you used that term, because it was an epithet uh, used, popularized actually mm -hmm. by the American Medical Association in the 40s when they were fighting against the national health insurance system, then backed by uh, President uh, Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. um, although, to go back to your question, the French would say no, uh, no, no. Uh, they would say, we don't have socialized medicine. That's where you, you find that more commonly uh, in, say, the, the old Soviet Union, or they may, would point, if they knew something about it, they would point to the American Veterans Administration Hospitals um, and things like that, or even to the British system. I mean, mm -hmm. throughout history, they always um, avoided a British, or as I said earlier, German-style systems. Um, so I think when you come back to that term, socialized medicine, uh, you have to look at what one means by it. Precisely. And certainly the French, uh, looking at it from that point of view as a story, and I, I do that, they um, value, they look at it from a consumer, consumer point of view right. where they want to have, as I mentioned before, the patient choice of physician, direct access to specialist, and really a lot of prescriptor freedom for the physicians. Now I'm talking about ambulatory care now. Mm -hmm. um, their hospital sector is, is much more privatized excuse me, uh, much more in the public sector. But uh, so th that's why this question of socialized medicine should come up early in our discussion, mm -hmm. and then it becomes, well, who's controlling the insurer then? Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. And in, on that question, um, if I can, again, I'm trying to always do this very explanatory way, they have a public uh, insurance system in which the um, in, 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 employers and employees actually sit on the boards oh. of these insurers. And so it would be as if you had, um, say, representatives of the AFL-CIO, the Teamsters, um, sitting together with uh, you know, members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and they are controlling this very large amount of money, of course, because mm -hmm. they, they're collecting large amounts, like here, um, through wage levies, right? I see, so I they're see. doing with payroll taxes, yeah. and of course they're working with the government um, in consultation with physicians, and negotiations with physicians to set uh, fees. Work, work us through, uh, Paul, if, if you will, uh, a kind of a basic example. I mean, uh, assume a, a kind of a, st a straw figure of a uh, patient consumer, mm -hmm. how he or she would relate to the system. I mean, First of all, I, I get the impression already that the individual chooses his or her own physician, mm -hmm. and then what? I mean, how does it, how does it function? How do you uh, 
How do you get into this? How do you get treated? Well, it's, it's an easy question to answer, and it should be very easy for your for listeners and viewers because it's like American medicine was before uh, managed care came to us oh, in the 1980s. So. Really, it's fee for service, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of patient choice. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, patients need to pay their physicians directly and then seek reimbursement, but m in most cases, actually, the the public insurer. Um, will pay the physician directly. And um, in general, uh, there's more uh, f physician freedom in ambulatory care. They don't need to deal with large managed care corporations mm -hmm. who are overseeing their utilization, ordering of tests. There's less defensive medicine, really, uh, being practiced in, in France. You know, uh, that sounds like the halcyon days of our, our experience here. I mean, the... the uh, um, the fee for service that you mentioned, it seems the physician access is, 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 is quite, is quite uh, generous. Yes, uh, there's very good access. I mean, that is one of the points that I, I would like to make apparent in the book mm -hmm. is that it is quite different. Sometimes you, in, in the public debates mm -hmm. uh, in this country, sort of foreign systems are tarred as there's waiting, uh, there's always the lines mm -hmm. for procedures and et cetera. One of the most popular things that Tony Blair did upon acceding to office in Britain mm -hmm. was to allow uh, uh, NHS, that is National Health, Health Service, Service right. patients go to France to seek uh, procedures. Well, they can do that. Uh, so he cut his waiting list dramatically, a very popular move. And, mm -hmm. and of course, the French loved it. It gave some more patients. The physicians liked it as well. Yeah. Um, so you, there, isn't, um, there, is, there is a lot of um, free choice in the system. Now, I'm not going to stand on the program, of course, and say they don't have their problems. Right. I mean, that's one of the things. You, you alluded to that early in the introduction. Yeah. I want, they, you, to, I want yeah. you to get to those problems, but let me ask you one question. Maybe this is one of the problems, in fact, uh, and uh, a good time to treat them. First of all, a comment on my part they, they, that I've learned from you and from things you've written. They, they have managed to do the things that you've just said for... I took it to be about 95 percent of the population. Is that right? This is it's truly it really covers practically everyone in France. Well, since 2000, and it was they were slow getting there, but it, mm -hmm. since 2000, it's 100 percent coverage. And in 2000, they were rated by the World Health Organization as the best healthcare system in the world, right? That's right. They they uh, they got the number one spot on the World Health Organization. Uh, and and we placed 37th. That's in that true. Same survey, just mm -hmm. by, by way of comparison. So, Paul, uh, maybe now we should turn to the other side of the coin, what they might be afflicted with and facing uh, as we speak, but. And maybe this is the first question in that regard. Is all of that you just described, which sounds uh, really quite remarkable, expensive? How yes. much does it cost to them? Oh, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the fourth most, most expensive healthcare system in the world. Mm. Uh, they're spending 10% of their GDP. They're mm -hmm. spending over $2,500 for every man, woman, and child in the country. Uh, it's still a lot cheaper right. than ours. Right. Um, so that that is there's a there's a question of efficiency there uh -huh. um, that is quite you know quite yeah. different. Yeah. Well, but even so, I mean that um, it may it may be more expensive, but they're getting a lot more f for it. Yes, yeah, so they do have the universal coverage. Right. Um, and that is very helpful because at some point, and, and again, this is not my my ballywick, so to mm -hmm. speak. Uh, but at some point, it, there is a trade. There's not a trade off, but rather a relationship. Um, between non-coverage and healthcare costs, because as uninsured or underinsured, um, you know, ill-stricken or accident-stricken right. peoples uh, need care, mm -hmm. uh, they end up in the emergency rooms. That's a very expensive way right. to treat uh, people, and so those people, of course, the hospitals have to recoup those 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 costs. What do they do? Well, they raise their health insurance premiums for those of us who do have insurance. Right. We've had experience with that right here in our own country. Mm -hmm. uh, Run us through, Paul, the, the additional problems or issues that France would face in this. I think you're helping us, I think, enormously to understand the system. And as I said, it sounds in many ways admirable, but what are the further problems that it might be facing or challenges? I think, for example, of an aging population as mm -hmm. being something that may be creating pressures on the French healthcare system. Absolutely. They, I mean, they, they face the same uh, troubles that we do with mm -hmm. uh, a graying population, fewer workers paying into the system because, like ours, it's, a, it's an employment based system for the most part, although they're trying to switch away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have fewer workers paying in. Of course, they've got more people to um, to pay for in those health in, in their in the hospitals and in mm -hmm. doctors' offices. 
Um, so that they, their problems are very similar to ours. Just, mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why I like this this, mm -hmm. this study is because they, they many of the, the French hold these same values. They want the same things from their healthcare system. They have the same problems. They want this, um, what I call in the book, mm -hmm. entente medicine. That is mm -hmm. this idea of patient choice, of physician freedom of prescription, of patient confidentiality, and those kinds of things. But it's awfully expensive. Right. Direct access to specialists. Now that's where the French actually are tra taking a, trying to take a, ta a, a, a play a page from the American playbook, so right. to speak. That's precisely the point I wanted us to, to get in this conversation. And uh, everything you said actually has been a revelation to me, and I think to all those who are viewing. But your book and your and I think your very message, Paul, as a scholar and uh, in this area, a writer as well has been to promote this whole idea of dialogue between both these nations, as I understand it, mm -hmm. on the subject of health care. So if we reverse the question now mm -hmm. and say what might be the subjects of mutual interest and where might France derive some benefit mm -hmm. from our experience, and our problems are pretty well known to, to most of us, what would they be, what would you say, what, what sort of direction should that take? Well, let me just give you a couple examples. One, uh, I'll just follow up on that, that page from the playbook. Uh, the French are now instituting uh, gatekeeper uh, general physicians, yeah. general practitioners. So they want to um, cut back on the access that their population has, the direct access their population currently has to yeah. expensive ex specialists, ophthalmologists, yeah. etc. And so oh, that of course has created a ruckus among the French population. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one example. In order to do that, they've raised the consultation fees. They've, the the um, GPs are going to be able to charge more because they're referring now on to the specialist. Mm -hmm. One of the other things they've done, which is, again, they're, they're sort of copying the American system, mm -hmm. and we'll see how it works. But they're doing it in a little different way. They want to affect utilization and volume of uh, physician treatment and procedures according to sort of evidence-based best practices medicine. So they've taken the research, just like insurers have done in this country, in Medicare and Medicaid, um, and they look at the evidence and they say, well, for this uh, diagnosis, here's the tests and here's the, the best uh, mm. sort of prescriptions that can be um, uh, de derived or prescribed right. in those cases. But in order to do it, what they've done is, they have about 50,000 physicians in France, mm -hmm. so they've, six, they've sent out 6,200 sort of technicians out to sit down, sort of in the same way that we're talking now, mm -hmm. to sit down and sort of do some tutorials, if you will, with the physicians about right. what they should do uh, in certain cases. And it, it really, it's an educational campaign. There's no, as of yet, there's mm -hmm. no um, uh, a hammer behind this, I, and that we may see one, but um, that, of course, would run counter to this value that they've held rather successfully, uh, more successfully, in fact, from the American physicians, if you look right. at the history, um, um, of having a lot of prescriptive freedom for their doctors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's marvelous. That really, it's absolutely fascinating to me. Paul, I want to delve into history a little bit more with mm -hmm. you. Uh, you. You mentioned, uh, in a very riveting fashion, uh, fashion actually, the um, use of World War I as, as an important point in your book, the forthcoming mm -hmm. book, and the way in which, uh, the continuing way in which both of our societies seek to honor the same values, I would think, you would, you would agree, in, in terms of what we provide medically. I'm interested in some other points of the 20th century and how they influence this mm -hmm. uh, convergence or divergence. Right. Let's go to the, the Great Depression era, right. the era of social insurance in this country. The, my, my first question is a very strictly American one. Why didn't we get um, healthcare coverage when we got Social Security. It was, I've always wanted to ask a No, no, no. That. It was certainly on the agenda, and it, it, it was quite close, mm -hmm. um, that certainly when uh, Franklin Roosevelt came into office, he was considering it. There was a very powerful members of his administration who uh, recommended it. Mm -hmm. um, however, when push came to shove, there were rumblings in Congress, especially from Southern legislators who mm. didn't want the federal intrusion, the states' rights movements in the South. And even though these were these were Democratic, um, you know, allies of the right, president, right. Franklin Roosevelt being a Democratic president, um, that, of course, bolstered by the opposition of the American Medical Association and um, you know, insurers were also players in I this see. game as well. And it was, I would say. Ultimately, it was perhaps the biggest thing that didn't happen in the history of American health care was the president chose not to include health insurance as part of the Social Security Act of 1935. Right. Thank you so much for that. I've always wondered why that, that didn't happen. And conversely, uh, what did France do at that point? 
in its healthcare system? They were in the midst of implementation. They had a, a knockdown battle in the 1920s after the First World War. Uh, the physician I described earlier who didn't want government intervention went back uh, to their offices and the, after the war um, the, the state stepped forward, that is the government stepped forward and says we want to do something now for all those workers who suffered so much, who have lost their families. And I think part of it actually has to do with the promises made during the war. Right. If we have to remember that the, the death toll in France was 1.2 million. Yes, exactly. And another mm. million uh, you know, injured or, or disabled. In this country it was only to mm -hmm. 165,000, a, a, a terrible uh, loss, but mm -hmm. then not, none comparable, of, to not comparable to the loss mm -hmm. in France. So there were more promises made in the mm -hmm. four years of war. So, I, so there was a process by which in the 20s, French physicians um, ultimately compromised mm -hmm. with the government and they signed on and co agreed to cooperate with this sort of an emergent national medical insurance system. In exchange, the physicians, rec the physicians received statutory protections of these values that I mentioned in the beginning. This was this 1927 mm -hmm. medical charter. Would you say that World War II was as powerful an engine of, uh, mo of momentum in uh, French healthcare as World War I proved to be? I would say yes. Um, during the war, the, the Free French under de Gaulle in, were planning uh, what, to ha what was going to happen in, in France uh, once the Germans had been defeated. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they looked at was uh, what explains this, this humiliating defeat, mm. really, at the hands of Nazi Germany. And one of the things they came to was this tumultuous politics, this class conflict, this very violent uh, politics of the 1930s. Um, and they decided that what they should do is create, try to create anyway, a more solidaristic, that, that's uh, a terrible English word, yeah, I, I stumble over it. I think it, I know what you but, mean. But that, it right? is uh, a term that, 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 you know, solidarité is the French, the way the, the, way the French say it. And uh, they wanted to create this very inclusive society, so they launched this thing that they call their s social security, is what they call it, 1945. Right. And as I said, it was quite slow to get everybody in. But by 1970, they had 95%. That 95% end. By 1970. And yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing us to 1970 because I'm very interested in the sort of including three decades of the 20th century, which I think may have been a time of increasing divergence in the way that our two countries treated um, health problems. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps there's one question just prior to that that's, that's, uh, that's even more basic, and that is if I understand things correctly, Paul, in the 1950s, we were both experiencing major inflation health care costs. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. But there was a significant difference in how they were treated mm -hmm. and how they were absorbed. Mm -hmm. And what was the French experience versus the American experience in that? Well, I mean, it's really the question ought to be, uh, not that you would know, but it, since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. I mean, this health care price increases that we're experiencing today are just another chapter. This right, has been going right. on since the 1940s. So, mm -hmm. and, and really, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about the sources of that. Mm -hmm. Because Certainly. it's really in um, the... Um, the, the definition of health, mm -hmm. um, how we define that term health, it's in the post-Second World War period that that term really becomes uh, redefined, really. I mean, if, I, if we could just now snap our fingers and revert somehow overnight, and I'm not saying we should do this, mm -hmm. um, to a 1920s definition of health, we would solve many of our health care problems. That's interesting. Because in the 1920s, the, the health was defined simply as the absence of malady. I mean, the meaning is more encyclopedic now. Now it's encyclopedic. Now mm -hmm. the, the, the definition is essentially the you know, complete physical mental well-being, which I'm, I'm not quoting now the Wealth, World Health mm -hmm. Organization, but that's the most, most uh, people would define it that way. Mm -hmm. And that is combined with ever better pharmacology, medical science, technique, you see, mm -hmm. then you have this very um, self-reinforcing uh, forces in play whereby if you have this definition of health in which I you see. can always be more well uh -huh. and then your health care system is ever better at providing you with that, mm -hmm. um, you make you run faster and um, fewer headaches and more potent and et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. then you're going to go for those things. Right. And so that drives up the cost of health care. Um, to return to your, the, the, the part of that question, how did they deal with that? Well, this is the 1950s is a period of time in which the American system is, be, is 
although expanding into private health care. I mean, this is the time, the 1950s and the 60s of the golden age of uh, private voluntary health insurance in this country, um, especially at the collective bargaining table, the FFL, then the, especially the CIO, very successful mm -hmm. at getting health care coverage for their members. But, but as the health care costs rise, what, one of the things they turn to, and very effectively, but it is a problem, it becomes a problem l later on, is what we call in the, in the industry, they call it experience rating. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Which is where they work with the insurers to say, hey, look, we have a working population. These men and women go to work every day, so they have some minimum level of health. Um, and also, this is the job, and so the insurance companies are very effective, and this is their job, right? right. They're at underwriting, and their actuaries start to work, and they start to figure out how, how low can we get these prices for this, these groups. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as you start to do experience rating, of course, in fact, Blue Cross, for a long time, didn't want to do it. Right. They were forced into it by the commercial insurers. Yeah. In France, meanwhile, um, you have this constant battle going on between the public insurance funds and the, um, the physicians and the hospital administrators. And ultimately, that, that problem gets settled in 1960 when um, de Gaulle comes back to power and um, he uh, works with the doctors and forces them into a binding fee schedules in which they negotiate mm -hmm. with the public insurers every, well, every four years right. about. Yeah. Well, this is all, I mean, it's not just fascinating, it's, it's the stuff of life for all of us. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no one who can be indifferent to the kinds of things that you're investigating and talking about. And uh, not to put, I hope, a too simplistic point on it, but you, you mentioned this health care cost is an escalating thing over the past 50 years. It seems to me you're saying uh, we're going to have to pay more because we're expecting more mm -hmm. uh, from what we mean by health care now. Mm -hmm. Paul, our time is, is limited, but you've already given us some valuable lessons. One last quick question. Okay. When's that book going to be available? Well, I'm hoping to complete it by the uh, first part of next year. And do you have a title? Uh, it's called Liberty, Equality, and the Pursuit of Health. When it is ready, you come back. Okay, great. And thank you for today. Thank you, George. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wwic.si.edu. I'm George Liston, CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. Thank you, Paul Dutton. Okay. That was masterful.